there! Welcome to Skeleton Key Productions. I'm Crime Grace Kogon. Let's get into the video. Today's video we're asking the question of what if the Spartacus Revolution of 1919 had succeeded? So, as we always do with our videos, we're going to first of all talk about a bit of the uh, context of this, because many of you may not have heard of it before. So that's what we're going to kind of dive into in the course of this video. So, first of all, what was the Spartacus uh, Revolution? Well, first of all, during World War One, obviously Germany was uh, fighting against the Allies, and you know they were being uh, blockaded uh, by the British Navy, and you know at, at a certain point they were surrounded on all sides. So, although uh, by 1918 they had uh, defeated the Russians on the uh, Eastern Front and you know knocked them out of the war and stuff, it was still was a thing where they were getting ground down on the Western Front, and this caused a lot of like dissatisfaction for many of the people in Germany. And in particular, there were many uh, sailors uh, in the north of Germany, uh, along like the kind of Baltic coast and like the, the North Sea coast. And many of them had kind of been stuck in their ports and stuff. And many of them were very angry and they end up, you know, leading uh, an uprising, basically a mutiny. And this mutiny spilt over to uh, basically end up becoming a full blown revolution in which like the, the industrial workers of Germany end up rising up against the Kaiser's uh, regime. So the Kaiser, who was like the emperor, he ended up being overthrown and he was thrown into exile. And there was the new republic that was established, which later became known as the Weimar Republic, which is named after a small uh, uh, city in Germany and stuff, right? And so that's how the Weimar Republic ended up being formed. However, as with all revolutions, there's never just the revolution, right? There's always that kind of like after effects of it. There's always, uh, there's always that kind of aftershocks. And so this is kind of what we saw with this revolution as well. So basically during the war, you had like a split between the kind of socialists, right? So prior to the war, you know, around the world, socialists had all kind of believed in the idea of, uh, you know, the, the workers of the world have no nation, you know, workers of the world unite, right? And so there was the idea that, you know, like working people from England, from Germany, from Russia, from France, etc., etc., that they had more in common with people of the same class as them than they do with like their the uh, the elites, like the aristocrats and, and like the, the bourgeois, basically, the, the, you know, the business people and stuff, right? Now, World War One kind of threw a spanner into that all that theory because the working class of like the countries end up basically being like, right, we feel more solidarity with our fellow countrymen than we do with workers from different countries, right? And they enthusiastically were behind the war. So people who had this kind of notion of like this internationalism, World War One basically kind of like disproved that theory yeah, that actually people feel more uh, you know, kinship with like their fellow countrymen, even if they are higher class, yeah, or like a lower class, than they do with like foreigners, basically. In the same way, you know, you might have like a, you know, I don't know, a factory worker in England and a factory worker in India, the two of them on completely different like, weight wages and stuff, yeah, and they will still feel more like of a connection with someone from like a, you know with like the the factory owners from england and the factory owners from india you know respectively right so it's kind of something to kind of like bear in mind that the war led to this split between the the socialist movement so there, there was a faction of the socialists yeah who you know they became known as, as like the spartacus league and this spartacus league they were the ones who were very much opposed to the war, right? So Spartacus, for anyone who's seen like the film Spartacus, uh, it's a very famous uh, Stanley Kubrick film, although he didn't really want to make the film. That's something which we'll cover in a few months' time when we're going on into like like film reviews and stuff, so definitely stay tuned for that. Kubrick's a big inspiration for me. Um, but anyway, um, so Spartacus was a slave during Roman times, and he rose up against... Um, the uh, Roman Empire, yeah, and led a huge slave rebellion, which eventually ended up being crushed, which is kind of ominous because you'd think that they would champion a slave who led a rebellion that was successful. I don't know why you'd want to, like, follow a slave re rebellion which wasn't successful. But anyway, the, the point is that they called themselves the Spartacus, right? And the Spartacus, you know, that as soon as the war began in 1914, they set up the Spartacus League. And basically what ended up happening was basically a split between uh, the, the, you know, the Social uh, Democratic Party um, of Germany, which I think is the SPD, or maybe I've got it the wrong way around or whatever, but either way. So you end up having a split within that movement, yeah, between the ones who were basically pro-war and the ones who tend to be more communist, yeah, and these are the ones who were very much anti-war. So 
Now that the war had obviously uh, finished and stuff, and Germany had uh, you know surrendered and and signed, signed like the the armistice uh, documents, right? Basically, Germany ended up being in a bit of a tumultuous stage at this point. So obviously, you had some people who really wanted to further the revolution, and then you had other people who wanted to kind of conserve it and stuff, right? Whenever there's a revolution, you have to, like, appeal to some sort of, like, moderation and stuff, yeah? Uh, you have to, you know, in order to, like, consolidate things, yeah? You can't completely alienate people by becoming too, too radical. And so, while, like, the, the main people who were in charge, like, uh, most notably uh, uh, President Friedrich uh, Ebert, who was the first uh, president of the Weimar Republic, while he was trying to appeal to kind of moderates and middle class people and to like the, the you know the, the former like kind of like Prussian military etc cetera, etc cetera, these people here were taking things very very like radical right and the Spartacus movement was led in particular by Karl Liebknecht and by Rosa Luxemburg who we touched on uh, last time when we were talking about uh, the Paris Commune right uh, so definitely check that video out out um, because yeah there's lots of like good stuff in that as there are with all of our videos. So the Spartacus League was committed to undoing three things in particular, right? One was militarism, two was imperialism, and the third was capitalism, which for them, they saw as being all one and the same. They saw World War One as not a clash between nations, but basically a war between like different competing uh, capitalists, right? Uh, so this is basically a bourgeois uh, war, which has been like fought uh, with like the blood and sweat of the proletariat of the different countries, right? So they basically were opposed to all this kind of stuff. And, you know, as it was said in the Spartacus Manifesto, yeah, I'm going to basically paraphrase it now. You know, they said that basically it's not a question of, you know, d uh, democracy or dictatorship, yeah? They said it's a question between bourgeois democracy, which is basically the kind of like liberal democracy, which we all know about, yeah? or socialist democracy, right? So these people were in, on the face of it, were advocating for uh, democracy as they saw it, right? And they said, like, to quote what Marx said in terms of like, the dictatorship of the proletariat, what they basically said is that the dictatorship of the proletariat should not basically be done by uh, violent means, right? As had been kind of advocated by Marx, but had to be done through kind of like mass organization, had to be done through the political system. What they had been arguing for is that the revolution ought to be peaceful and it ought to also be popular it ought to be a grand like kind of a general upswelling of the people themselves taking over their factories taking over the means of production and stuff yeah and that's how the revolution ought to be kind of managed however in early january of 1919 yeah so like on january the 5th they decided right what we're going to do is we're going to fly in the face of all of that and we're going to have a violent revolution, right? So this kind of went against the, the words of like uh, Rosa Luxemburg in particular, but this is basically Karl Liebknecht and like especially many of the kind of people like uh, below him, yeah, they were in favour of basically seizing the opportunity, yeah, because they're like, right, in the same way in Russia, you'd had, you know, the February Revolution, which was just a general uprising, and then you had the Bolshevik Revolution, which basically seized the means of production, right, and, like, took over, like, the apparatus of the state. This is what needs to happen in Germany. You've had, like, now the, the kind of, like, Weimar, like, kind of re revolution as such, yeah? Now we need to have a proper socialist revolution. So this was what had basically been argued, and... This kind of is something which we touched on in the, the Paris Commune one, right? When we spoke last time about like uh, Blanquet, right? So Blanquet, as I kind of said in that video, was Lenin before Lenin was Lenin, right? Because what Blanquet was advocating for was a tiny elite of people basically taking control of the means of production and of like state, state apparatus, right? And not waiting on the great masses of people, yeah? And this is essentially the same approach that Lenin took in Russia. However, as happened with the Paris Commune, it ended up being a failure because the revolutionaries couldn't kind of agree, right? And because it kind of been so last minute and just like, well, let's, let's kind of just make the most of it and stuff, right? They hadn't really made a plan of how this would really pan out and stuff, right? So this is basically why it ended up failing. So now that it was the 5th of January 1919, you had this popular uprising, right? And the major problem with it, of course, is that as happens with all kind of revolutions like this, yeah, the government is not in favour of it. So as we said before, where they want to consolidate power, this is not helpful. And so Friedrich Ebert end up basically wanting to crush this. However, it would have been very politically kind of messy had he called in the army uh, to do this, yeah. The idea of basically sending the army in to like, crush an uprising, 
doesn't really bode very well, uh, especially when this is uh, meant to be kind of a liberal Republican stuff. It kind of looks a bit bad, right? So what they did instead of calling the army is they basically got a group of militia together uh, who were called the Fry Corps. Now the Fry Corps, most of these had been uh, former veterans uh, who had served on like, the Western Front and stuff, so you know they're battle-hardened people. And on top of that, they're very much anti-communist, right, and very uh, anti-socialist as well. And so for these people, they are like very much itching to basically crush any kind of like uprising that they can. And so by employing these Fry Corps, yeah, it's a thing where first of all they are much more ruthless than uh, like the regular kind of army would be. Second of all, they have a kind of like ideological kind of commitment to crushing this thing. And thirdly, unlike the army or unlike the police and stuff, there's no real accountability, right? You know, they're basically just armed mobs, yeah, like patrolling the streets. And so they can kind of get away with doing whatever they want. Um, and yeah, there's not really any way to kind of like rein them in and stuff, right? So it's kind of one of those things where you know, Friedrich Ebert uses the Fry Corps basically to be able to crush the thing without getting his own hands dirty and stuff. And he doesn't really care about the kind of consequence of this, right? And the leaders of the movement, yeah, in, you know, like uh, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, they get arrested, they get handed over to the Fry Corps. And, you know, because obviously, like, the, you know, the German government can't be involved in what happens next, right? The Fry Corps end up assassinating them. And then, you know, they end up getting Rosa Luxemburg's uh, body and throw it in a canal. And I believe that it wasn't seen again for another, like, few weeks and stuff. Yeah? So people were searching for it, but it wasn't seen for another few weeks. And so, yeah, that's kind of how it ends up being, like, played out and stuff, right? And actually, you can see this in the very good uh, German film, which is uh, Rosa Luxemburg. It's from uh, 1986. There's also a new film, which has come out in, like, 2019. I've not seen that one yet, so I can't really say whether that one's good or not. But definitely check out the one in 1986. Is actually really really good. Obviously, try and find one with like English subtitles if if you can't speak German. But whatever, like kind of like the point is, it's a really good movie, right? Um, and it will kind of explain a lot about like the history of this, right? And that's kind of how the the uprising ended. So very much like the Paris Commune, it's you know it's built on this kind of like like idealistic kind of like stance. But at the end of the day, it's not really well thought out, and there's not really kind of any kind of follow up plan. And it's crushed in a, like a very like brutal way, much more brutally than the people who kind of planned it were expecting. Yeah, they kind of they probably expected it to be just like the revolution had been a few months ago, where like you know the navy and the army kind of gets involved and like kind of takes the side of the revolutionaries. But yeah, people can put up with one revolution at a time. They can't like put up with multiple revolutions, especially once we become more and more radicalised. As the kind of saying goes, like, you know, the centre must stand or something like that, I can't remember now. But now that we've looked into the history of this, now we can kind of ask the question of what would have happened if it had been successful, right? Now, the massive caveat is this would never have happened. And it's never going to have happened for like, multiple reasons yet. First of all, as we said, it's not organised. Second of all, you know, it's, it's too radicalised and stuff, right? It would have alienated too many people. Thirdly as well, it, you know, the Communist Party didn't have anywhere near as much support, right? So Spartacus League, as we said, like kind of evolved into like, the, the, the Communist uh, Party of Germany, yeah, so the KPD. But the KPD, even at their absolute height in like uh, uh, the summer of 1932, only managed to secure 17% of the vote, right? They boycotted the elections in 1920, but, you know, like, so the, the one that they stood in, like, where they actually, like, put in any kind of effort in 1924, that was the first election that they actually really, like, tried for, yeah, they got 12.6% of the vote. So, you know, talking about overthrowing the country with between one six or one eighth of like the country being behind you mm, it's gonna be kind of difficult and stuff yeah not to say it couldn't have happened obviously the Bolshevik revolution was done with relatively low numbers but still there was a much more kind of like support for the Bolsheviks yeah than there was currently for uh, the KPD in Germany so it's unlikely that there would have been you know enough support for people to have kind of got behind this right so this is something we have to kind of re really bear in mind that even if somehow it, it had succeeded, it would have been an uphill struggle just to secure things in Germany. Never mind, of course, like the wider like, implications of like the outside world.
because of course obviously Germany had like surrendered but the Treaty of Versailles was not uh, signed until June of 1919. Now obviously during like this kind of time period yeah you had the Russian Civil War still going on and the uh, Western Allies yeah basically had sent in troops to uh, you know to crush the, the Bolsheviks in Russia. So you know having this revolution in Germany they put troops into Russia, but obviously Russia is relatively far away from the European, like mainland, I mean, like, like from like Western Europe and stuff, right? So Britain and, and France it wouldn't have been as bothered. But certainly if there had been a communist uprising in Germany, they probably would have put much more troops into Germany yeah, to crush a communist revolution there because it's literally like right on their doorstep and stuff, right? Which means that the Allies would have either had to basically ramp up uh, the, the military spending and like commitment and stuff, um, or they would have had to be like right we're kind of fighting on two fronts this is kind of like quarter a day and stuff right so whichever scenario is more likely i can't really tell you because germany going communist is uh, it's a big game changer and stuff yeah like there's lots of kind of there's kind of too many variables to kind of take into consideration there so obviously let me know in the comment section what you think might have happened but i kind of think that they would have put more effort into into like crushing uh, communism in germany and kind of like left russia as like a back burner but i think in the same way as they overstretched in russia i think eventually it would have been overstretched in germany so with that being the case well how would the terms of versailles have been well in our own timeline the treaty of versailles was very harsh but the Treaty of Versailles was meant to punish Germany. It wasn't meant to completely destroy the new German government, right? You know, if this had happened, I think that the Treaty of Versailles would have been much harsher and the terms and the amount that, uh, you know, the Germany would have had to, like, uh, repay and stuff would have been much steeper because the Allies now would have been trying to actually, like, destroy, like, kind of uh, the communist government there. So they would have put it in terms which would have been pretty much unpayable or at very least would have, like, completely crippled like the German economy in such a way as to kind of spark an uprising against the communist uh, government there. So I think that it would, you know, even if they didn't win in a kind of military campaign in terms of like throwing, uh, like overthrowing like the, the communist government there, I still think that through uh, reparations and stuff, they would have like really kind of uh, squeezed uh, the new kind of uh, uh, Spartacus kind of government. But of course, if there's a communist uprising now in Russia and now in uh, uh, Germany, then this means that communists around Europe and the rest of the world are going to be emboldened by this, yeah, because they don't just have, you know, a, a kind of spark in the pan in, in one instance, right? They, and they can now see a trend, yeah, like, like so they can already see it's been, it succeeded in Russia and now it's succeeded in Germany. So many revolutionaries around Europe would probably be like, yes, now is our chance to strike. Can't tell exactly where this would have happened, but this is something to really bear in mind, yeah, that, like, because this is such a big game changer and stuff yeah there's no way of telling how it might have spread around europe there's no telling which country it might have sparked off in next it could have been somewhere in central europe or eastern europe we we just don't know because it's just kind of you know during that time it was very very unstable like kind of in central and eastern europe you had all these like new countries that were being formed and you know there was like devastation from the war it realistically could have happened in any one of these countries but something to note is that what's often forgotten in the west is that around this time you also had the polish soviet war or the soviet polish war I always forget which way around it is but this was an attempt by the soviet government to basically reconquer poland because most of poland had been part of the russian empire before the war and basically that kind of the Bolsheviks wanted to retake all of uh, what had been a, a Russian territory beforehand right so the Polish uh, Soviet war the Polish were able to uh, fight off the the Soviets and you know to defend themselves however in this timeline if you'd had the Soviets to the east and then the Germans to the west What's to say that you might not have had a repeat of what would happen later with uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, yeah, where Germany and Russia basically crushed uh, Poland and you know take it over. So if this were to happen, we can kind of imagine perhaps World War Two doesn't happen, but perhaps like uh, the the Nazis don't like rise to power and stuff. Perhaps. Again, there's so many different variables. The longevity of this kind of new like uh, government and stuff, we have no way of kind of saying. But lots of arguments say that Hitler isn't able to rise to power. 
what would end up happening is basically the Cold War kind of would start 20 years earlier, right? So rather than it starting in like the, the mid 40s, instead it happens in like the early to mid like 20s, right? In which you had, you know, a communist Russia, a communist Poland and a communist Germany, right? So the whole of Central and Eastern Europe is basically dominated by communist governments, right? So this would have really kind of like scared uh, the, the powers in Britain and, and France and in America. And more likely than not, there wouldn't have been as much isolationism, there wouldn't have been as much uh, disarmament and and, you know, the Western powers would have been much more war ready than they were in our own timeline. So there's so many variables that happen with this timeline. So I don't, you know, want to stray into the kind of incredible in the sense of like, it's incredible, like what I'm saying. So with that being said, I'm going to have to leave that timeline as it is. But please let me know in the comments, think, uh, you know, what you think would have happened. And also stay tuned for our next video, which is going to be on what if Tito died during World War Two, right? So this is General Tito. Uh, this is the person uh, who ended up leading uh, Yugoslavia, the communist leader there. It basically split uh, from like the Soviet Union and kind of like went his own way. So basically we're talking about the impact of if somehow he died at some point during World War Two. So... Yeah, and like, what, what effect there would have been if he hadn't been the leader of Yugoslavia after the war. So, if you like that video, definitely don't forget to hit the like button, share with your friends. Uh, you know, sharing is caring. There's always like, you know, much love to people who share videos. Also, as well, we have our own uh, Patreon account, so definitely you know, uh, go into the link in the description and help us out there. That, that will be, you know, that will really help out the channel. This is my full time job, so every little helps, and uh, you know, that will really help me out. Also, as well, we've uh, ordered merchandise, so. Hopefully, in theory, we should have the prototypes being ready for the 6th of September or sometime around that time. So I'll show them when they're ready and stuff. Also, as well, follow us on Instagram because then you can kind of like see like, uh, uh, you know, like the latest kind of things that like within that kind of regard. And um, yeah, that being said, have a great day and bye.